Hey guys, so I've wanted to do this video for a while now. I've been kind of working on it here and there. Um, I've noticed there's a lot of misinformation out there, uh, online, YouTube, um, Reddit. Um, when it comes to lithium ion battery circuits, uh, specifically having to do with safety considerations, and we've done quite a bit of work on them um, on our designs, and we've done some work through UL and other governing bodies with them. And I'd like to just kind of take this video to kind of go through um, some of like the do's and don'ts uh, specifically related to say if you're trying to get something through UL. Obviously, this is in no way a method to pass UL. Uh, UL is very difficult. It's expensive. Um, and I'm just going to kind of share some of the, the tips and stuff and what UL looks for and just some general safety considerations um, with lithium ion batteries. The first thing, um, this video, it's only gonna focus uh, specifically on single cell uh, designs. Personally, I've never worked on anything with multi-cell. Uh, there will be a lot of parallels between the two, but specifically it's going to be just a single, um, mainly a cylindrical cell like the 18650s or even the pouch cells, but a lot of those have built-in um, protection circuits, which this is going to assume that there is no protection circuit built-in other than whatever would be um, mechanically safe with the cell. So just a quick background with UL. Um, typically getting something passed through UL, assuming it doesn't have any AC, so like plugging into your wall component, at least in the US, it's not typically required by law, but a lot of distributors think like the big box stores, they won't let you sell an electronic device unless it is UL listed. So it's something that's a really good idea to have. Uh, it helps a lot with liability and just general safety concerns because then you've shown you've done your due diligence and this circuit, this product, this widget is as safe as you can feasibly try to make it. So even if it's not something that you actually get UL listing, it's it's always smart to kind of pick up a standard that your product might fall into and see if you can get it to test and it would pass for it just doing the testing on your end. And lithium ion batteries in and of themselves are one of the more dangerous um, circuits that you can work with for obvious reasons. Look at the Galaxy and the Note, all the issues that they had um with them catching on fire so there's obviously a big reason why you should take these seriously and again that's why i wanted to make this video just because people kind of are lackadaisical and they assume that the charge protection circuit or whatever's built into the cell is kind of the catch-all be-all and that'll protect everything which in an ideal world, it's true, but of course you have to assume worst case scenario, that's not the case. So the big thing with a lithium ion battery is you wanna kinda consider the battery pack itself or the battery cell to just be an energy store. The biggest risk of danger to the cell itself is when you're putting in energy. When you're taking out energy, discharging, the cell itself is losing energy as you do that. So the risk of something bad happening to the cell is a lot lower. Doesn't mean you can ignore it, but your biggest issue typically, again, a lot of the issues with the note was when it was being charged or after it was charged and it's full of power. So the biggest concern, no matter what else you take from this, is no matter if your battery has a built-in protection circuit or not, you have to have a way to control the charging, whether it's with a completely custom approach, which I don't recommend, or a dedicated charge controller that handles the overvoltage lockout and, or overvoltage cutoff and the max charge current at any given time, that is a must. No matter what, what else you do, that is the man, minimum mandatory for a safe circuit. The second really important thing is, and this is a big miss in the hobbyist world, is a 18650 cell is not an 18650 cell no matter where you buy it. You need to make sure you get a UN 38.3 cell. So that basically means in and of itself, even if you have no other protection methods, it should 
prevent a catastrophic failure. Again, you cannot rely on that and you should not rely on that. But if you start with an approved cell, your risks of a catastrophic failure decrease tremendously. eBay sellers will obviously always say that they're uh, UN 38.3. Is that the case? Probably not. Um, so I would always recommend it's not worth trying to save a few dollars. Get a reputable cell, whether it's a Samsung or LG, get something that you can actually trust and that limits a lot of your risks right off the bat. So now on to the UL testing. And again, this is not a guarantee that it's going to pass or not a full-fledged uh, safety guarantee. Uh, I just wanna kinda go into some common things that are in uh, that are in common with most of the UL standards, at least the ones that I've seen. Big thing with UL for a lot of their testing, but lithium ion batteries in specific, is they do what are called single fault tests. So they'll have a list of all the tests that they'll do on your product, and then they do it again in a single fault, single fault state. And what that basically means is they will go through your schematic and they will find each one of your protection circuits and will either short or open any individual one to basically bypass it. So say if you have a fuse, they will stress test it, do whatever it takes, and they'll make the product break, but safely break. Then they will go back, short that fuse, so the fuse no longer works. Then they'll do the test again. It still has to break safely, and UL does not care about usability. They don't care if you plug it in and it completely breaks. As long as it breaks safely, that's all they care about. So you have to make sure that you don't just have one line of defense for protecting the battery, which is smart because if you have a solely a firmware protection on a microcontroller, if that firmware gets locked up and your watchdog doesn't trip, now your battery is completely unprotected. So what you'll see is a common theme that I'm doing here is having at least two forms of protection for every catastrophic event. In this example that I'm gonna be going through, there's gonna be more than that. Um, I'm kinda of just gonna be doing the most overkill so you can kinda of see what all can be done and what lengths you can really go to protect a uh, lithium ion battery from failure. So the general testing that UL will do is they'll do a standard charge, how you rec the manufacturer recommends it, a standard discharge, same thing. They'll do a few balancing issues with multi-cell, which again, that's not my expertise, so I, I can't comment on those. Then they will do a overcharge condition both over voltage, so if it's a nominal 3.7 volt cell that you charge at 4.2, 3, 4, whatever, they'll charge it at 12 volts and see what happens. Then they will do an overcharge with too high of a current. So instead of charging it at 1C, so one times the rated current of it, they will do it at 5C. So you're supposed to charge a cell at uh, 1,000 milliamps, they'll charge it at 5,000 milliamps, see what happens. Then they will do a short circuit, so they will short circuit that battery from any of the outputs or in some cases from a specific point on the board if it's exposed to where someone could feasibly short it with a metal object or something. Then they'll do a few environmental testings like crush, overheat, drop, I'm not gonna get into those because that's more of a uh, mechanical design, but that's the actually what was the issue with the uh, Galaxy phones. They didn't allow the uh, pouch in the uh, lithium ion cell to expand, it was too tight. So instead of being able to expand, it was pinned together and that caused it to overheat and bad stuff happened. Okay, so on to my uh, the example, and I'm just gonna go through a few in um, KiCad, and I'll just talk about each approach and how they can build on one another. I'm going to do these with a single purpose IC, uh, so there's a lot of 
battery management and charge controllers that can take on many forms of each other so you wouldn't have to use all of these separately for the sake of this example i'm only going to use uh like single purpose ic's and i'll explain when when i start talking about some that you could combine and there's a lot of options for different charge controllers different ic's and everything this is in no means a recommendation on the specific ones i'm using they're just some that i've used in the past and they seem to work well uh, but they're thousands and thousands of different options. So the first form of protection, which is so cheap and so easy to implement, you really should probably have it on any, is just a simple inline fuse. This isn't going to wear out over time. It's not gonna have a firmware bug. It's just a simple fuse. And what's nice about a fuse is if a dangerous condition happens, it shuts off, it will not turn on again. So you don't have to worry about something with one of the ICs. If it's in a dangerous state, something gets shorted. Every time you power cycle, it shorts, then shuts off. Shorts, then shuts off. Fuse, once it's tripped, it's tripped. Really not much to talk about here. Um, you obviously want to do standard overrating, which I typically do 150%. So this is a 12 volt fuse. This battery we would assume is rated for uh, standard max operating uh, current of 8 amps. So if it goes over 150 times that, that's 12 amps, it'll start to trip. Um, obviously, or not obviously, but fuses don't actually trip when they're what they say they will. Um, but that's another topic for another video. So easiest thing, throw an inline fuse. That's going to prevent mainly a short on the discharge side, but if something really bad were to happen charging, it could also prevent that. And this can also be replaced with a thermal fuse. So if it gets too hot, it will trip, which that, that covers the most dangerous condition, which is an overcharge when the battery gets hot. So the next step from a inline fuse would be having a dedicated battery protection IC. This is one from Diode, Diode Zinc, I believe, yeah. So what this does is essentially it takes your positive input from the battery, passes it straight through, doesn't touch it. It takes the ground side and passes it through. These are a single FET, but you could also have two discrete back-to-back -back FETs, which the, uh, management IC can turn on and off. So this allows the controller to be able to turn on and off the negative side of this battery whenever it sees a fault condition. So how does it do that? Well, it detects a over voltage and an under voltage by detecting the voltage from VSS to VDD. It will detect over current by checking the voltage drop from VSS to VM. And since you can calculate what the voltage drop at different currents are across the FET and a resistor, it will shut off if it's over the current that you wanted. So this prevents a overcharge, both current and voltage. It prevents a over discharge on voltage and it prevents a short circuit or just too high of a extended current by shutting off the FET in any of those events. So this in and of itself can prevent from pretty much every unsafe condition other than heat. And there are battery management ICs that will have a thermistor in it, but the thermistor side and the heat is almost always a charge issue so you'll typically see a thermistor on the charge controller side and not on a dedicated uh, protection IC. Choosing these, because again, I'm going with the most bare bones and single purpose controller, they suck. So basically they have like 50 or 75 line items of different part numbers. So this one is COTRG1N. And that represents the current threshold or the voltage threshold, the over voltage threshold, the under voltage threshold, 
and it it's a pain. You have to go through and pick out all those, uh, go through all those specs, size the MOSFETs for them, but it's a really cheap approach and it does work well. So this one will shut off at basically 4.2 volts. If it goes over it, it'll shut off below 2.7 volts and then a 0.1 volt over discharge current cutoff. And again, that's from VM to VSS, which is how they detect the current. So one big issue with these is since you are calculating the voltage drop across the FETs, it's really inaccurate because the voltage drain to source, which this is technically uh, source to source, is really, really variable depending on the temperature and what specific line item of the FET you have. So what I did here and I've never really seen it talked about, but it works really well, is if you are to add a little, like a shunt resistor here, it basically will overwhelm the variances in the FET, and it makes your range of voltages and the range of current thresholds a lot tighter, so you can more accurately control when this will shut off. So you can see by doing the resistance from source to source and calculating what the current threshold is based on the uh, voltage that it'll trip, this will shut off the system when the current is between 7.7 .7 and 11 amps. It's still a big threshold, but if you have a dead short, it's going to be over that very quickly. And the key with this is this should always shut off before your fuse because if it's just a one-time event, you typically will want this to shut off before the fuse blows and it destroys the whole system. Now, that goes against with what I said about the fuse opening, which is true. Um, you can never protect both sides, but typically you do want the IC to trip first because you can continue using the product assuming that that fault condition is removed. Once you have your fuse and this circuit in place, you should have your double fault state to where this can be bypassed or this can be bypassed and at least the discharge side will be protected no matter how they test it. From here, it goes to a, they call them like a fuel gauge or a uh, charge state detector and that's basically what it does. It uh, monitors the voltage of your cell and how it's charged and discharged. And over an I squared C line, you can figure out what the current voltage is, what the capacity, what the historical um, configuration is, whole, whole lot of things. Um, and now this is something that can be built in to your uh, charge controller or your uh, battery protection I see, but again, I'm keeping them all separate. And what's cool about this one is it has a thermistor. So if you attach that thermistor to your battery pack, your microcontroller now has a direct way to read the temperature. So a firmware protection approach would be to either tie in a microcontroller line to these or to have a microcontroller line to your main output. And now if it detects that the um, temperature is too high, the microcontroller can cut off all power. That opens another can of worms because when you cut off all power, the microcontroller shuts off so you can kind of be in a loop state, but there's ways to get around that with a latching circuit, which I'm not gonna go into, but that's a simple way now, not only in hardware, you have firmware control of it. And in the same token, you can add a uh, ADC line from a microcontroller to your uh, battery voltage line here, or ask your uh, fuel gauge what the voltage is. And if the voltage is too high or too low, your microcontroller can shut off charging or discharging. Another firmware approach. So now with these three 
protection schemes and your firmware from pretty much every fault condition, you have at least two forms of protection. But we're not done. <laughs> so the final thing, and like I said at the start, this one is really the important one that has to be there if nothing else is, and it's your charge controller. I'm really not gonna go into a ton of detail here because every charge controller is different. Um, there's a lot of ways you can adjust the settings, but they all essentially do the same thing other than one big difference, and I'll cover that. So this is an example. This is just a block I took from a project that we had in the past. It's a Type-C charger, which we can detect the um, CC pins, whether it's connected to a Type-C block, a uh, wall wart, a computer, or what else um, can source current from it. And based on the program pins, we can determine what um, current we, or actually the SEL, CE, and Probe 2 pin, we can set how much current the battery is going to be charged with so you don't overload the source. So that was fun. Um, and you definitely want to get a charge controller that has a thermistor because when you're charging, that's the biggest likelihood that the battery will overheat. So the charge controller needs to have a thermistor. Everything else doesn't really have to, but you'll rarely see a charge controller without one just because, again, it's pretty much mandatory. The one big difference, and I have a previous video on a pure hardware um, approach to this, is you have to make sure you take into account what the system does when it's plugged in and charging. My old video, and I'll, I'll link it here, is I would basically switch from drawing power from the battery to drawing power from the wall the second it's plugged in. Because what you have to, and this is really important, and actually on this board, on the first revision, we kind of overlooked it. You cannot draw from the battery directly while you're charging it because how is your charge controller going to know what the voltage is or what the charge current needs to be if you're drawing power from it? it? It can't, it'll get confused. So you can either do a pure hardware approach with discrete components like in my previous video where you just simply switch to the wall and let the charger charge the battery. Or you can use, and I think analog devices or uh, TI, one of them, they call it their power path, but they all have it. And basically what it is, is it has an outline, which I put as my 3V8 um, power net. And basically this is what you draw power from. So all of the, the rest of your circuits will take power from this 3V8 line. And this is intelligently switched by this charge controller. So if you're not plugged into the wall, the out pin is straight from your battery, which again, your battery goes through your protection scheme to your bare lithium ion cell. When the battery is, or when the type C cable is plugged into the wall, the IC will intelligently give you power. And it depends on what IC you use, but you can look in the data sheets and it'll typically be a mix. It'll be a mix of wall and the battery. If you're not drawing a lot of power, they'll just give you power from the wall and it keeps charging the battery. If you get over the threshold of what this charger can give to you, so basically, if you're trying to draw more than an amp, it obviously cannot source an amp from the wall so it will then switch over to giving you power from the battery. But you really don't have to worry about it. As long as you make sure to spec this to where it is able to source on the out pin all of your power management needs on the downstream circuit, you're fine. And it really simplifies things because then you don't really have to think about it. Just draw from the out pin, let it do its thing, and you're done. So that pretty much summarizes just kind of the main key ways in which you can protect a lithium ion cell. 
you can combine a lot of these into a single IC or you can exclude them. But just always keep in mind that this is going to be one of the most dangerous parts of a circuit and one of the most hazardous if it fails. So you really want to do your due diligence and make sure you're protecting that battery and make sure that fault conditions are handled. And probably the most important thing, no matter what else you do, how much you listen to what I said, test it. Take, pretend you're UL, make, make three or four circuits. If you're going to sell this, it's, it's worth it. Make three or four of them and test them until they fail. Charge them at too high of a voltage, charge them too long. Do any sort of condition that you think could happen in a worst case scenario and see what happens. If, if nothing else, it makes you feel a whole lot better knowing that you've tested this and it's not going to burst into flames and potentially hurt or even worse uh, to anyone who's using it. And that's kind of the overwhelming goal with uh, electronics and circuit design. You wanna make sure your product works and make sure it's safe. So I hope you enjoyed this. I know it was a little longer than I typically do, but I wanted to I wanted to cover this pretty well. So let me know if you have any comments or questions, and if you have any suggestions for future videos, let me know, and I will see you in the next video.